got your notebook. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 9 of CN Live. Doctors warn Assange may not survive appeals process. I'm Elizabeth Voss. And I'm Joel Loria, Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News. Doctors for Assange began writing to governments in late 2019, warning that imprisoned WikiLeaks publisher Julian Assange was in a fragile state of health and could die in prison. The doctors have repeatedly called for his release on urgent medical grounds. Since then, the medical experts who examined Assange testified in court to the seriousness of his medical condition. They explained that he would not survive oppressive prison conditions and his extradition to the United States was denied on those grounds. The High Court in London subsequently stood by the medical findings and ruled that the medical evidence could not be challenged. Meanwhile, having won his case, Assange remains in the very conditions that caused and perpetuated his precarious state of health in the first place. With appeals set to drag on for years, unless Assange is released from prison, there is every reason to expect his condition to deteriorate, potentially dramatically so. And given this medical evidence that is openly on the table, Doctors for Assange warns that Julian Assange may not survive the appeal process itself. The group, which includes over 250 medical professionals from 35 countries, penned an open letter to the Biden administration earlier this month, urging him to drop the Espionage Act charges against Assange. The authors asked the US leader to halt the misguided prosecution initiated by the Trump administration before its dire consequences become Biden's responsibility. The letter comes as the leading witness for the prosecution, a diagnosed sociopath convicted of fraud, forgery, and child sex abuse, confessed to making false claims against Assange in exchange for legal immunity, with the revelation that the indictment was fraudulent, the case has effectively collapsed. This is the latest in a long series of violations of judicial integrity associated with the prosecution of Assange, including illegal spying on him and the denial of his right to consult with his attorneys. According to the doctors for Assange, The collapse of the legal case against Julian makes his continued arbitrary detention in a dangerous prison all the more reprehensible, underscoring the urgent need for Biden to drop the case now. On the same day the letter was sent, the UK High Court granted the US limited permission to appeal District Judge Vanessa Barreto's January 4 decision to not extradite Assange on the grounds of his mental health and the condition of US prisons, which combined put him at high risk of suicide Crucially, the High Court, however, did not permit the U.S. to appeal the findings based on Assange's medical and psychological status and affirm Baritz's decision regarding his clinical condition. The doctors noted that in light of this ruling, the U.S. avenues for appeal appeared limited. Specifically, the U.S. was refused by the High Court the right to appeal Baritz's decision to accept the evidence of defense Mm -hmm. witness Michael Kopperman, Dr. Michael Kopperman, on Assange's medical condition. Astoundingly, the U.S. has now been granted the right to challenge the High Court's decision not to allow the U.S. to appeal that part of Barrett's decision based on Koppelman's testimony regarding Assange's health. That challenge will be heard at the High Court on August 11. To discuss this, we're joined tonight by Dr. Bob Gill, writer and producer of the film The Great NHS Heist, by Professor William Hogan, MD, specialist in internal medicine, and a professor of biomedical informatics. Dr. Melissa Johnson, a PhD clinical psychologist and writer in Australia. Dr. Jill Stein, MD internist at Lexington, Massachusetts, a former instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School and a two-time US presidential candidate. Dr. Derek Summerfield, an honorary senior clinical lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience in King's College. University of London. He's a former chief psychiatrist at the Medical Foundation for Victims of Torture. And by Dr. Sue Wareham, OAM, Order of Australia, an MBBS general medical practitioner who is now retired. She's a co-founder of ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. She comes to us from Australia. Our producer is Kathy Bogan. I'd like to invite you all to share your thoughts now individually for five to 10 minutes before we get into a general discussion. And uh, Alyssa, I was gonna start with you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks for having us all on. Um, Well, so coming on to talk today, and I was thinking about that first letter we sent back in 2019 and thinking about what's changed since then and what's stayed the same. 
Um, and a lot has changed, but a lot has also stayed the same. And I think the fact that so much can stay the same while so much changes really sort of speaks volumes in terms of where we're at at the moment. Um, so, you know, just before we sent that first letter, we actually received a fair bit of pushback behind the scenes. We were told that we were practicing armchair medicine and being Twitter doctors and violating the Goldwater rule and we shouldn't do this. Um, the Goldwater rule is that you can't um, diagnose somebody you haven't examined yourself. Uh, but we stood firm and we said, well, look, we're not issuing any diagnoses. We're issuing a warning about foreseeable and predictable medical and psychological harm that can and should be expected to be occurring and to get worse as a result of the persecution and abuse that Julian Assange and medical neglect that he's experiencing. Um, and, you know, it's based on information that was in the public domain. So, you know, one thing that's changed is that now, you know, the very sort of medical and psychological harms that we were warning about have been described in court by doctors who have examined Julian Assange and it accords with what we were saying, you know, and it was sort of part of the point was that we hadn't, um, we didn't have any inside knowledge about Julian Assange's medical status, but it was just obvious based on what was happening that this is what could be expected and sure enough, that's what we heard. And, you know, the court, as you've said, heard uh, evidence about the seriousness of his medical condition to the extent that he would be very unlikely to survive extradition into brutal, oppressive prison conditions in the US. But despite all that, one thing that stayed the same is that, of course, he was sent right back into the brutal prison conditions in the UK, you know, that contributed towards him being in that really dire state of psychological and physical health. And, um, of course, another thing that's changed is that Julian Assange won his case. The US lost, but still he's in prison in, you know, the most punitive, harsh prison conditions available in the UK that have been deemed arbitrary detention and torture and cruel and, you know, inhuman degrading treatment by the relevant UN authorities. Another thing that's changed, as you've said, is the US case has fallen apart. You know, their key witness for the last superseding indictment has admitted that he's lying and it's come out that he has a history of fraud and child sex abuse. But still, Julian Assange is in prison. The world's leading human rights groups and press freedom groups have come out since we wrote the letter, really come out in force and unequivocally standing by Julian Assange and denouncing the extradition request. Still, he's in prison. Since the US lost, politicians all around the world have appealed directly I mean, from across the political spectrum. I think recently the president of Mexico and several countries appealed directly to Biden to drop the charges, but still the US is pursuing Julian. Uh, and another thing that's changed, of course, is the US administration has changed. Uh, so these Espionage Act charges that people sort of attributed to the Trump administration's hostility towards journalists it, stand under the Biden administration you know so I think where that leaves us is in a situation where there's a long slow drawn out abusive process and whether the US brutalizes Julian Assange by extraditing him or whether they brutalize him by keeping him in prison while they pursue endlessly pursue a case and cause appeals to go on for years no matter how shamefully discredited their case becomes both are dangerous. They're both dangerous for Julian Assange and they're both dangerous precedents. Um, you know, the extradition, of course, sets a dangerous precedent for free press and democratic rights and freedoms. But a long, slow public torturing of a journalist in public sets a torture precedent, which is equally dangerous. Even the medical evidence that we now have, the longer this goes on, the more we can expect Julian Assange's health to deteriorate, the more dangerous that becomes. And then we become societies that torture journalists to death if that happens, which we can't come back from. So, you know, I think that's where we are now. And those are the medical and democratic dangers that we're facing. Jill. A big thank you to everyone listening out there and uh, to Doctors for Assange and uh, Consortium News. And I'll just add to the summaries that Lissa and Elizabeth have already stated, which I think are really wonderful. As I listen to Lissa's words, it reminds me of an article uh, Chris Hedges just wrote. I think it's called The Collective Suicide of Empire or something to that effect, you know, about how empires go down in a blaze of militarism. 
which is goes hand in hand with uh, human rights abuse. And, you know, I'm listening to Lissa describe the outrages of this case, this, you know, I don't really understand how anyone who's informed about this can consider it anything but, you know, um, a complete mockery of justice, a kangaroo court. Um, you know, it's almost hard to uh, listen to the legal discussion of this, which puts formal names on this as if it was a legitimate process, but it sort of violates, uh, you know, basic human rights and judicial integrity and the assumptions that we live with a, a, as a democracy. So I, I just want to express, you know, uh, it, it, it would drive its victim to suicide, which is what psychological torture does. But I have to say it, it, it almost explains Chris Hedge's title, you know, the, the collective suicide of, of empire. It's such an inherently abusive process. Um, you know, it just, uh, it's to say it's, you know, infuriating or that it destroys the fabric of society, you know, is, is kind of an understatement. And I'll just mention one tangential fact, you know, in, in the US, uh, about half of Americans refuse to take uh, the COVID vaccine. You know, our faith in our institutions has been utterly destroyed, even where our own lives are at risk. And, you know, to look at this case uh, sort of exemplifies that. So I'm just going to describe a little bit of what I find, um, you know, just uh, especially shocking. And, and these are some of the facts that are hidden because, unfortunately, you know, journalism is supposed to be the watchdog of, uh, of governmental power. But in the US and so much of corporate media around the world, it's not the watchdog, it's the lapdog of authoritarian power. So um, we're not informed as citizens and members of society about, you know, this case in particular. And to my mind, this is really a poster child of what is wrong, you know, the state of emergency that our democracy is in. We're in a state of emergency for the health of Julian Assange, but also for the health of our democracy. And, you know, to look at, uh, you know, certainly press freedom, uh, as Lisa was saying, to have a an eminent journalist, probably the most consequential publisher of our generation and perhaps of, of a century, to have this publisher sitting in the dungeon of a COVID infested, high security, dangerous prison, you know, is, you know, tells you everything you need to know about what this means for press freedom. And, um, you know, the psychological torture aspects of this are just overwhelming. Consider stripping someone, yourself, for example, you know, consider stripping you of, of your communications, your social connections, uh, all of your rights, you know, innocent till proven guilty doesn't apply. Um, uh, you know, you all the rights that were established uh, in, in the, um, you know, the, the Bill of Rights for the United States, what were they established for, you know, as safeguards against authoritarian power, you know, against arbitrary um, searches and seizures and um, uh, arbitrary detention, all of that. I mean, every single right in the book has basically been stripped uh, from Julian Assange. So he is subject to arbitrary detention, to solitary confinement, uh, to character assassination campaigns that he cannot respond to because his communications uh, have been uh, completely shut off. He is the subject of an Orwellian uh, prosecution that systematically has violated the rule of law and uh, due process and is based on little to no facts. That's according to the uh, UN Rapporteur, um, Nils Melzer, who has studied the case very closely and who, as it happens, speaks four languages, including Swedish. So he's very familiar with the, um, you know, with the actual facts, or shall we say, lack of facts uh, in the case. Um, uh, Julian Assange has had his communications with his attorneys completely shut down, not to mention uh, spied upon where, where they you know, where they've managed to uh, confer in, in the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, and 
uh, you know, has been consistently surveilled uh, and essentially ensnared for uh, prosecution and, and for uh, extradition. And I wanna just add the outrages of this sham of a legal case in which the, both the CIA and the FBI have been implicated in constructing the um, situations intended to create crimes or violate his rights. Uh, but the point being that the security agencies have been very involved in this. And, you know, to, um, uh, I'll just make two more points here because I don't want to go on too long. But when you think about the involvement of the security agencies, think about what um, Mike Pompeo, who, you know, was previously head of the CIA here in this country uh, before becoming Secretary of State. Uh, his comment, I think, is more telling than any I have ever heard uh, about our security agencies. And what he said was that, uh, and this was a quote uh, in a talk that he was giving at a uh, university, I think it was Texas A&M in 2019. So it's not like this is forever long ago. This was pretty recent. And what he said was at the CIA, you know, our motto is we don't lie, cheat or steal. And, you know, something to that effect. He says, well, you know what? We lied, we cheated, we steal, we stole, and we had whole courses in it. And he giggled, you know, and, and I think this is, this is probably the best uh, summary of what's wrong with our security agencies, which are what one would expect in an empire wh whose purpose really is the acquisition of power, resources, and money for its elites, which is why empires self-destruct, as Chris Hedges points out in his uh, excellent article. But this is what you get. And um, these security agencies were involved both in the surveillance of uh, Julian Assange with the installation of cameras into the embassy, uh, but they were also involved, the FBI was involved in, um, uh, in constructing crimes, basically, in engineering crimes in Iceland. And this is, you know, this has been, um, you know, shouted about by the interior minister of Iceland. There's an excellent uh, panel uh, that was done by Consortium News that included him uh, and others, uh, which was just, you know, mind boggling. And anyone who uh, thinks that this case is not important or that this case doesn't really, um, you know, represent a state of emergency in our democracy, let alone for Julian Assange, uh, you know, really ought to uh, listen to that panel. It's really incredible. The FBI came to Iceland to frame Julian Assange. It really documents how the FBI essentially engineered crimes against Iceland and tried to use those crimes to implicate Julian Assange. And that has really been a symbol of what a kangaroo court this case is. Any of these facts in and of themselves should have been enough in any real court of justice, they should have led to the outright dismissal of this case. I don't understand how the prosecution is not liable for some kind of malpractice, which is really destroying people's lives and destroying our society. To say that the case should be dismissed is the least of it. But this goes on. The recent exposure Lissa described of the star witness whose character speaks volumes of the character of the prosecution, someone who has been convicted of fraud, forgery, financial crimes, and child sexual abuse. This is the star witness whose testimony has now been shown to be fraudulent. And what is this case doing in court at all at this point? It is completely a sham and demonstrates that our legal system has been hijacked as well as human rights and press freedom being destroyed. But it's in a pretty sorry state of existence to start with that the press has been really missing in action and derelict of its responsibilities here in its failure to cover this case. So I think this is another case in which we the people, we are all being disserved and the remnants of our democracy is being murdered in front of our eyes, as well as this long term effective destruction of Julian Assange. It's a very important rallying point, and um, you know, and I just want to give great 
thanks to people who are not uh, sleepwalking through this, uh, you know, or or brain dead, and who are actually uh, mobilizing because this is a really important focal point for us to stand up take our democracy back. It's been flawed to start with, but that's no excuse for letting it be destroyed, um, you know, and, and mobilizing on behalf of Julian Assange. Thank you. Thank you. Derek. Um, well, uh, Jill said much, but I would say, um, just to reiterate, the kind we've been standing on for two years, on the one hand, uh, is our sense of it as a citizen, a citizen supposedly of Western liberal democracies, witnessing this sort of implacable abuse by process and how far this has given us an angle on the soul of the state, the dark heart um, of the beast, it seems to me, uh, in a way that is absolutely shaming, isn't it? What it says about uh, what the governments of the US, the UK and Australia really feel about democracy, really feel about a free press is obviously something that we've uh, seen unfolding. Um, what they're concerned about, of course, is the threat of a good example. Snowden is holed up in, in Moscow. Manning was uh, given a presidential pardon, and they really want this one to stick, uh, it seems to me. So the words like oppressive and torture, I must say, as I've said before once, the UN rapporteur Melser, when he first saw Assange two years ago, he was unusually for a, for a, a rapporteur forthright about uh, psychological torture. Um, I suppose I've interviewed hundreds of people who've been through these sort of experiences actually over the years in various settings. Um, it's remarkable that Assange hasn't been able to keep his head up in some way so far, I'd say, but I would certainly uh, commend uh, the conclusions drawn by Professor Copeland, who's a distinguished London consultant uh, neuropsychiatrist in London, a former colleague of mine actually, where not only was he talking about the risk, but he seemed almost to be virtually predicting suicide for Julian Assange. And I suppose that risk will continue whether, uh, if he continues in, in, in this sort of limbo in the UK, as well as uh, what would happen if he went to the US. Um, we know already that uh, US prisons have been held to violate the UN Committee Against Torture by their internal conditions, not the least prolonged solitary confinement. Here we're talking about a man who's had two years solitary in a high security business if he was a mass murderer, as opposed to the others that he's uh, illuminating being the mass murderers, and several years in virtual solitary before that in an embassy. This is a kind of long drawn out, hanging, drawing and quartering. Um, I don't think they would mind if he committed suicide perhaps in some ways. The main thing is to, to avert the threat of a good example. Um, as people say, this has always been um, a political matter an additionally ominous thing is the way that the mainstream newspapers, including the London Guardian, a supposedly left of centre party, who published, who published some of um, the Assange material and now have dropped him comprehensively. They've been touched up by Secret Services, I no doubt. Uh, and who is on his side? He has a legal team. He has uh, our kind of movement, but he is terribly alone facing the state, isn't it? And yet to me, he is what a cutting edge citizen actually is in this age, a purveyor of truths, um, demonstrating how governments lie to us, how they, they uh, commit atrocities against uh, foreigners with impunity. I hate to think what will happen somehow if we lose this case. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sue. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I'm um, representing Medical Association for Prevention of War and I really, I can't do much more than to confirm the concerns that have been expressed by others, all of us here, and especially the health professionals, at this real travesty of justice and, and what's a deliberate infliction of suffering and that's just anathema to the health, health professionals. So a man with severely degraded mental health, um, subject to prolonged solitary confinement. The court knows that his mental health is ailing. Um, there's not, a, as has been pointed out, there's not even a date set for any uh, any hearing. So there's a prospect of, year, of this dragging on for years and years. Um, and I guess what we do know is that an, unless Julian Assange is released from prison, then his medical 
condition will is almost certain to deteriorate deteriorate further and this certainly amounts to cruel inhuman and degrading treatment um, as as we have stated there's no way that julian's mental health could be adequately addressed when he remains in the same situation the very situation that has inflicted this torture on him uh, in the first place over some years and there's no way that he should be sent to the oppressive conditions in u.s uh, US prisons. So we're, we're really looking at multiple failings of due process, which have all been documented. And we really can't come to any other conclusion other than the legal system has been totally manipulated to punish a man who's been in prison for years, he's been convicted of nothing, and he's suffering severely as a result. Um, so so the, the US is overseeing the torture of a man whose publications expose their own crimes and for that um, he is being published um, punished. And of course the UK is complicit in this and my own country Australia, um, Julian's country, um, uh, our government has failed him um, most disgracefully and monumentally. I do want to thank the Australian parliamentarians who've spoken out with parliamentarians for other countries. Um, and it's extremely important that they've done that. And I will just note that they've been from, um, not just from the, from our opposition party, but from both of the, both of our two major parties and also the Greens, the third, third biggest party, and also a number of independents. So really from right across the political spectrum in Australia, um, Julian has received uh, support. Um, the implications of this case for, uh, for journalism and for freedom of the press have been pointed out and they are extremely serious as Jill and others um, have, have said to us. The fact that a journalist can be punished for exposing the lies of his own government, um, it's pretty hard to overstate how serious this is for our right to know about what, it, what is done in our name. Um, so, um, MAPW stands uh, in solidarity with all of you, with all of Julian's supporters, doctors for Assange and, um, and others. We're appalled by his treatment and we urge President Biden, uh, President Biden to finally bring this travesty to an end by dropping these charges. And we call on the Australian government to finally find a voice and to speak up for one of their own citizens, Julian Assange, who's shown more courage than most of us will ever see. This case is political, it's sordid, and it's degrading for any country that talks about the rule of law and freedom of the press. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, William. Yeah, I want to bring uh, back um, the medical aspect of this and some of the medical facts. So like Lissa says, these are not our medical assessments, our medical conclusions, or our medical diagnoses. These are the assessments, conclusions, diagnoses, prognoses of our colleagues who are, have extensive expertise in these areas. The first expert I want to highlight is Dr. Sandra Crosby who evaluated Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy and wrote a letter to the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights about her concerns. And her concerns were that what's happening to Julian, even before he's evicted from the embassy, is a violation of the Convention Against Torture. She stated that directly. Dr. Crosby has extensive expertise, a world-renowned expert in the assessment of torture victims and working with refugees. Her credentials are impeccable. She supplied the Istanbul Protocol, which is the standard international medical protocol and legal protocol for assessing victims of torture 500 times. So she's done this over and over and over again. And when she assessed Julian, her conclusions were so concerning that she directly invoked the Convention Against Torture in a letter to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. That letter led to the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture Dr. Niels Meltzer, who's been mentioned before, uh, a legal expert to visit Julian. Uh, by the time he was supposed to visit Julian in the embassy, but due to the abuses and legal manipulations and uh, foreign affairs abuses between the United States, Ecuador, 
and the UK, they evicted him from the embassy before Meltzer could get there. Uh, that was deliberate, that was on purpose. They did not want Meltzer to visit him in the embassy before they had the chance to violate international law and evict him. Uh, but Dr. Meltzer visited Assange in Belmarsh prison in May of 2019 with two medical experts, uh, one of whom is a colleague of a member of Doctors for Assange. Um, also experts in the assessment of victims of torture, uh, also experts in the application of the Istanbul Protocol. All three individuals, the two medical experts in the UN Special Rapporteur examined and assessed Julian independently and all three independently conferred and, ca and, and came to the same conclusion before they conferred that this was psychological torture. So we have four experts definitively saying that Julian Assange is a victim of psychological torture. It's an undisputed medical fact and legal fact that Julian Assange is being psychologically tortured. It's um, no expert in the assessment of torture victims in the Istanbul Protocol has ever reached a different conclusion. And the conclusion is overwhelming. Uh, Dr. Meltzer has said that, the, that Julian shows all the signs of psychological torture. Um, so this is an undisputed medical fact. Recording in progress. That, that this, is, this is going on. The, the, the special rapporteur wrote to all four countries engaged in this legal frame up, the United States, the United Kingdom, Sweden and Ecuador. And they all responded in the same manner as the worst totalitarian uh, abusive nations and governments in the world, which is they didn't respond or they responded, oh, we don't torture. Um, they did not engage in a dialogue and under international law, when the special rapporteur has a finding of torture, the country is obligated under the convention of torture. That is sufficient evidence to initiate an investigation. No, none of those four countries has started an investigation into this uh, episode with Assange and his torture. Uh, the, the, the expert in Assange's extradition hearing on which the judge relied mostly was Dr. Michael Koppelman, as has been mentioned. The reason she favored Dr. Koppelman was he had assessed Assange on more occasions and at more uh, points in time and for longer durations than any other expert. He also, unlike the other experts, interviewed Assange's family and acquaintances. And he came to the unequivocal conclusion that Assange is severely depressed and at significant risk for suicide and would likely commit suicide if extradited. The other medical experts in the case did not evaluate Assange for as long or for over a, as protracted a period. And the other thing Dr. Koppelman did that impressed the judge was he took extensive contemporaneous notes uh, about his discussions and relied on those notes, hundreds of, I think, pages of notes, uh, which he summarized at the extradition hearing. Um, so, uh, Assange has multiple risk factors for suicide, including um, he's on the autism spectrum. Uh, he has a family history and, and he has severe depression due to all of the legal abuses that we've been discussing. The torture has now had an added physical component, I might add, where we heard this past winter that the prison refused to deliver Assange his warm clothes. So he was freezing cold. This is a well-known torture tactic to expose detainees to extreme cold conditions. This has happened to Guantanamo detainees as well documented, including, I might add a quick plug for the movie, The Mauritanian, if everybody wants to understand that America, my country, I'm ashamed to admit, the United States is a torturing country, we torture. And that's been well documented and we're doing it in the case of Assange as well. Um, and then, you know, just another medical aspect to this uh, that gets overshadowed, uh, perhaps rightly so, um, is just the, the invasion of medical privacy. So there was uh, the CIA um, spied on Assange in the embassy through a company called UC Global that's now being criminally investigated in Spain for its illegal actions at what it did to Assange and his visitors in the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, they film recorded his visits and audio recorded his visits 
with doctors. That's a grotesque violation of doctor-patient privacy. Uh, we object to that. We decry that. We call that out. America, you're reprehensible for doing that as well. Um, as an American citizen, you kind of have this some, some understanding of the international condemnation of our criminal justice system, especially with the death penalty typically, but for this case to have in part uh, come down to refusing Assange's extradition uh, because US prison conditions are so reprehensible and objectionable to the conscience of the world is also um, stunning to me uh, personally as American. Um, and lastly, if you are a healthcare professional, especially a medical professional out there or a psychologist watching this today, join us. Join Doctors for Assange, add your voice to the chorus. We need you, we need more voices, we need people to object to this treatment, and we need people to object to torture. And I know I said that was finally, I do have one more thing to say and then I'll wrap up, um, is that Nils Meltzer has written the introduction to an impressive volume that I took the time to read front to back called Interrogation and Torture. And there's a chapter in there written by, every chapter is written by a different author that describes how torture erodes the very foundations of democracy and justice and the rule of law. And so the more we torture, the more our democracy crumbles. And so this case of Assange is literally eating away at the foundations uh, of our society. Thank you. Bob. Hi, thank you uh, for inviting me to take part in this very important discussion. A lot has already been said about the detail about Assange's current predicament. There can be no doubt in people who followed, followed his uh, persecution that what we are witnessing is the state and the secret services of several countries colluding against the most important journalist of our time. And I'm afraid this is part of a wider authoritarian drift we're seeing in the States and I'm also seeing unfold in the UK. Um, there are talks of reforms to the policing and crime bill in this country, which will threaten to decriminalize you know, criminal acts uh, conducted by the police and the security services. There are efforts to uh, vote to suppress in this country. We're taking more and more leaves out of the American political playbook. And, you know, we're, we're, we're currently coming out of a pandemic where our own prime minister uh, has been quoted as saying, let the bodies pile high. And a former chief medical officer estimates 100,000 excess deaths, preventable deaths, as a result of the catastrophic handling of a pandemic. Yet the state imprisons a truth teller. The state imprisons the most important person who held up a mirror to these states that have conducted wars of aggression, resource grabs, killing a million Iraqis, and Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and others like him have shown that the democracy we are sold is largely a charade. And this is becoming more and more obvious the longer that the Julian Assange uh, uh, torture continues. And now we have the, the total discrediting of their chief witness, um, who you know is a proven, proven fraudster, as has been said earlier. Now this should, if, if there was never a point before now, this is certainly the point at which a credible government like the Biden administration projects itself to be should be dropping the case. So, you know, the facts um, in favor of Julian Assange are overwhelming. I think it's important for us as our group and other groups to continue uh, as our efforts in, in uh, publicizing his treatment, his despicable treatment in a maximum security prison. And, and building, building allies, it's good to see uh, politicians in Australia being more vocal about his treatment. It's good to see people in the alternative media. I can think of one great example, Jimmy Dore in America, who's highlighted the plight of 
Julian Assange. And I, I share the share the sentiment that every doctor should be joining Doctors for Assange to increase the momentum of our of our voice, our, the power of our voice. Um, and you know, from in terms of how it was never more important to have truth spoken in a democracy. Well, now is the time in the UK. Uh, there is leg legislation in Parliament at the moment which will render our National Health Service a copy of the US dysfunctional managed care system. And there is next to no appreciation of what's going on in our Parliament by the public. And this is the importance of journalism. Journalism is there to expose what the government is up to in an understandable way to the public so we can see what our leaders are doing in our name. And without the important work of unfettered journalism that can carry out its function without fear of being imprisoned, which should be a basic demand and a basic right, then democracy is dead. And our work in this group and others who are supporting us is very important. It's a protective factor for Julian's mental health to know there are people fighting for him. Stella Morris has been doing great work. It's, it's also good. Julian has his children to see uh, growing up, although you know the contact is extremely limited. These are all protective factors, knowing there are people fighting for him and knowing that the fight is getting bigger and stronger day by day. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for that. Your article on the NHS that we published has gotten enormous uh, readership. So I thank you for that. And I thank uh, Jill for pointing out that show we had. It was called Assange on the Brink. It was a couple of weeks ago when we had Kristen Happenson, the editor of WikiLeaks, the former interior minister of Iceland, the journalist who wrote the story in Strunden, and our own analyst, John Kiriakou, on prisons, and Alexander Makuris on the legal aspects of it. Vanessa Baretsa was the district judge that on January 4th decided to deny the U.S. extradition request. She did that on two grounds, on the health grounds, which you've been speaking about, and on the condition of U.S. prisons. When the U.S. applied for appeal, the high court granted it only on the grounds of the U.S. prisons. They said the U.S. could not challenge the findings on Assange's health. Now, the U.S. made an offer that they would send him to Australia if he were convicted and that they wouldn't put him in a SAMS in a uh, supermax prison in the U.S. But of course, if he did something, they would. It was based on that offer that the high court allowed the U.S. to appeal this case, which I, I find very disturbing. But now even more so, and this is what I want to ask everyone, is that the U.S. is appealing the decision by the high court not to allow any discussion or appeal of the health issues. And the U.S. was granted on August 11th a hearing in London to do that. Has anyone ever heard on this panel of a medical testimony? And it's basically Michael Cobham's testimony that was the basis of, as we heard, of Barrett's decision. And the U.S. is saying they want to appeal that when high court said you couldn't. So they are trying to appeal against the decision of the high court. Has anybody ever heard of expert testimony being challenged like that in a way that a, an appeals court already said, you can't appeal this. And the U.S. says, yes, we can. We want to, to try to appeal that. I find this is a really disturbing development. On August 11th will be this hearing. I don't know if anyone wants to weigh in, please. So um, I'll take a stab at it. No, I've never heard of it. Obviously not in the U.K. or a legal expert, but the grounds on which they would like to discredit Koppelman is because he protected the anonymity of Assange's fiance Stella Morris in his testimony. And the only thing he did was talk about her as two different people, not conclusively stating that she was the same person. So Koppelman acknowledged Stella as a part of Julian's legal team beginning, I think, in about 2011 and 2012. And then he also alluded to her as his mother of his children and a support that he had, uh, particularly in the context of the bail application in March of 2019 that parades are denied. And then as part of that bail application, that's why Stella was made public because the judge demanded it. Um, so 
that's the grounds on which they want to try and discredit Koppelman is that he implied, only implied that Stella was two different people when she's the same person. And uh, that's the entire basis on which they want to try and challenge Koppelman. Now, the prosecution psychiatrist also has a bigger and more serious issue of credibility and that he denied the existence of a particular report that the defense immediately um, submitted before the court, proving thereby its existence and uh, undermining the credibility of the prosecution psychiatrist. So it's like the most absurd and shakiest of grounds at which they're going after Koppelman. And if I could just add to that, um, I think it was one of uh, Consortium News's uh, legal analysts commenting about the case who said in the first place, uh, new evidence is not supposed to be introduced. So the whole, you know, the whole argument, well, the prison system isn't so bad. Let's look at the prison system in the US and it has, you know, aspects that are, um, you know, kinder and gentler. And, uh, you know, we'll just uh, put Assange into that wing of the prison system, you know, which is preposterous and really isn't an offer that they even made because the prosecution asserted that it would be able to change uh, Assange's status in prison uh, at the blink of an eye without any uh, review or accountability. So it was really a non-offer that contained a retraction within it. So it was bogus in the first place, but it shouldn't have been allowed as new evidence. So the very, you know, at, at its core, the appeal is illegitimate in the same way that this whole case is illegitimate. At every step, outrages are, um, you know, are, are present that are really grounds for dismissal. You know, the fact that, that the whole evidence uh, for the prosecution to start with has crumbled with the admission by the star witness that he was lying, which shouldn't have been a surprise in the first place. I mean, how ridiculous is it to have a, you know, a diagnosed sociopath, which means an recurrent liar, uh, you know, at the core of your case is like a joke. This case is complete mockery uh, of our uh, system of justice. And um, this was the first I had heard uh, when you mentioned, Joe, that actually there is a hearing based on the review of his medical system. It just adds, um, you know, outrage upon outrage here in this case. And, you know, I think this this becomes a really important point, you know, for us to uh, turn up the volume here as uh, doctors for Assange, because, you know, that's sort of the area of expertise that, you know, many on this panel have just commented on. And, you know, I, as one who's just, you know, I'm a garden variety doctor, you know, I'm a general internist um, uh, by training and by profession, although I'm not you know, I'm not an active clinical doctor as of recently, but I have instincts of a doctor and spent decades uh, practicing medicine. And, you know, I'm not an expert in torture, but I found what I was witnessing with Assange, which looked like a whole litany of medical conditions that, you know, medical and mental health conditions that were really putting him at grave risk. It was really agonizing to watch this as a human being, let alone as uh, someone in the health profession. It's absolutely outrageous. And, you know, I think it's important for us to be heard. Uh, and Doctors for Assange, I think, has a really important role uh, in, you know, in the coming uh, week or two to help get this message out. And I can't thank Consortium News enough for providing uh, a platform to help us, you know, not only get the word out, but even to hear each other because I find it extremely empowering to hear kind of the affirmation of our common humanity here. And I think society as a whole is really begging to hear this right now. As much as we are experiencing an authoritarian drift, you know, you can also see evidence all over the place that people don't like this one bit. You know, in the US, you can look at all sorts of polling, including the incredible disrepute that the public holds our press in, you know, our press, which is completely negligent on this issue and the needs of everyday people, you know, completely missed, uh, you know, the, um, the, 
crash of uh, Wall Street and you know the accountability of those who caused it, you know the weapons of mass destruction, you name it. On every major item, the press has either been missing in action or totally got it wrong because they are a lapdog, not a watchdog. Uh, unfortunately, in its current uh, corporatized uh, state. So, you know, just to make the point, um, we have a role to play here. And I think uh, it resonates enormously with deeply felt public need right now. I was just going to add on that um, question, Joe, about picking up on what um, Bill and Jill have been talking about, the question about the challenging of the medical evidence. And I was thinking, you know, that's really an extension of this abuse by process and the arbitrariness, which is part of the torture all the way along. You know, the US has gotten away with throwing due process and even laws out the window. You know, they're extra trying to extradite him under the Espionage Act, the US law, but they're not providing the protections of the First Amendment. You know, they want to extradite him under the US Extradition Act, but they want to abide by the conditions of the UK Extradition Act. It's this sort of Frankenstein's monster of piece together different bits of legislation and none of it makes sense, none of it's predictable, it's arbitrary and that's part of the torture that, you know, Julian Assange can't uh, know what to expect, can't plan his defence in any kind of reasonable way because goodness knows what could happen and the UK will say yes. You know, even in judicial, the conflicts of interest and the, the judge that's overseeing, the judge who's in the courtroom, etc. Um, and the other thing about it is uh, dehumanisation has been a big part of it, dehumanising Julian and saying, well, you don't have a right to have a doctor who has an opinion about your health. You don't have the right to the human right to health, which is one thing we're standing up for here. You know, of course, it's obvious to anyone looking that he's not well and he's suffering. And of course, he would be suffering. He's been in isolation for years. And it's in the same vein that the whole case has been run, as you were saying, Jill, and and that itself, I think, is the abuse and the torture that's ongoing now that's going to continue to cause the deterioration as this drags on. Um, so, um, you know, that's um, it's to be expected, but it's also to be, as you say, be denounced and decried. Yeah. It really does speak to the desperation of the Biden administration to keep this case going by trying to challenge now the medical issues. I mean, the Biden, when he was vice president, said that we can only really prosecute Assange if we can prove he participated in the stealing of U.S. government documents. Now, that has collapsed because this witness we've seen from Iceland has made up all of this and he's admitted he made it all up. So they have nothing left. And still, the Biden administration continues to try to get this man uh, to the point where they're now challenging the high court's decision not to allow them to appeal the medical side of this. It's just, it's just so desperate. I just wanted to make that comment. That, Elizabeth. Sure, yeah. And earlier, one of our guests mentioned the press. And I wanted to ask you all, as a part of Doctors for Assange, have you gotten any mainstream press coverage that you can describe for us? How has it been if it's been there? Or have you just been you know, blacklisted and not covered at all? Well, Lisa might be the best person to answer this. She's our press expert. But uh, the, I think the biggest amount of coverage we got in the press was in November of 2019 after the first letters started going out. That's actually uh, when I joined. Um, since then, it seems to have trailed off. Mm -hmm. And now, like, n none of us has been invited on any kind of um, BBC or MSNBC or Fox News or anything like that whatsoever. It's a complete blackout almost. Yeah, that's true in terms of the um, TV coverage. And it seems to vary letter to letter. So, you know, the first letter, yes, it was huge coverage, um, which was uh, took me by surprise. It was very, you know, it was a good surprise. Um, and, you know, things that were very unexpected happened, like there was a story in The Guardian in the morning that it went out, it was the most read story on The Guardian, even though it seemed like they had kind of tried to bury it, it was difficult to find it, but in the morning it was the most read story, which said that to me that there was a lot more support and interest in Julian Assange's case than a lot of people claim. Um, but, you know, mainstream outlets in the US and UK, and then since then, you know, some letters, like the letter to the Australian government got a fair bit of coverage, and I have to say in Australia we get quite often get um, almost saturation coverage in the local um, regionals. A press release will go out and they'll pick it up. So every little paper in every town all around Australia will run the story. And that happened with the letter to Biden. Um, 
I mean, you know, got picked up here and there. So um, we do get coverage and we do get mainstream coverage um, off and on. You know, it's, it's a bit hard to predict um, the Lancet that it's got coverage. It's, it's hard to tell what drives it. But my sense is when, when something is happening with a trial and it's not in the US interest for there to be coverage, that seems to be when we don't get it. I don't know if that, you know, if that's me reading something in, but that does appear to be a bit of a pattern. I'll just comment also, if I could, as Lise was saying, our mainstream media in in Australia are not good, so the coverage here isn't anything like um, what this issue warrants. But on social media, it's a different story, and we do get good interest from social media, and more so with the issue of Julian Assange and some other issues that our MAPW organisation of health professionals uh, works on. So there's certainly interest there, but it's our mainstream media that are letting us down. Yeah, and you mentioned the letter to Biden that you all wrote recently, and I wanted to just emphasize that again because I think it was a really, I mean, very well written letter. It had made a lot of really important points. Um, so, if, if any of you would like to discuss a few of those and just give a brief rundown of what you all um, sent to the Biden administration, that would be wonderful because obviously we didn't hear a lot about it in the media, um, as you might expect. I could say a few things about that. Um, yeah, so our main message, you know, was to tell uh, President Biden that he needed to drop this case uh, immediately, really, a case that he had inherited from Donald Trump, and just reminding people that um, Barack Obama had tried to pursue this and discovered the so-called New York Times problem that you couldn't hold Julian Assange uh, accountable uh, for publishing this material revealing war crimes, torture and corruption because then you would have to hold the New York Times and other mainstream uh, newspapers accountable as well. So they backed off and did not pursue the extradition but um, Trump did. And so Biden was basically inheriting Trump's case and his failure to disavow it and then to proceed to actively pursue it for, through the, um, uh, the appeal of the extradition decision, for example, you know, was a really dangerous thing and that Biden needed to drop it before it's uh, disastrous consequences become his personal responsibility. And you know, I think we are there now. What's happening is Joe Biden's personal responsibility. He is the driver of this right now. And then we wanted to point out how this would, um, you know, this is an assault on press freedom. It's an assault on human rights, and um, uh, uh, and on the integrity of our judicial system. So you know, that was our main concern. I don't know if others want to add to that, but you know, we were really trying to call attention to this, that this is now your doing and uh, you need to um, really fully understand what the dire consequences of this are. Um, you know, now with they're trying to overturn the health uh, decision as well, it becomes, you know, even more an active assault on the, on the part of the Biden administration. And just one comment on the side, which is that, you know, um, in terms of the attention, it's very hard you know, getting the attention of the press on something that's not trivial, you know, uh, uh, that press loves to cover, you know, little softball human interest stories. You know, I'm speaking of the corporate media here and, um, you know, not things that really challenge it or challenge the state of the U.S. empire. So it's, you know, it's a difficult um, sell from the get-go, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, you know, or that we just limit ourselves to the window dressing here. You know, I think we have to bear witness and the American public, you know, at the seat of the empire is not a fan of our media. And it's just a question of when, you know, when is this breakthrough uh, going to happen? Chris Hedges, you know, describes how in the uh, Stasi state um, in East Germany, that uh, he was, uh, 
either there or nearby at the time. So he was following this on the ground and described how the proponents of democracy thought that a breakthrough was just not on the horizon, you know, maybe a decade off. And then suddenly, you know, the mobilization just hit critical mass. And, you know, it's like when Occupy Wall Street broke out and, you know, things like that. You don't know when these things are going to happen. And I think it's really important for us to continue bearing witness. There's a lot going on right now, you know, between, you know, the assault on human rights and this is, and uh, really our civil liberties, which are under attack on, you know, on all fronts as, you um, Bob Gill, you know, was mentioning with these uh, laws that are sort of permitting greater militarization of police and so on, you know, which of course is happening in this country too. Um, <clears throat> there's certainly an all out assault on our, on our um, civil liberties. Uh, you know, we have the pandemic, which is resurgent and not under control, you know, globally and puts us all at risk. And the climate, you know, is absolutely, um, you know, exploding right now, um, you know, so we sort of have multi-system failure going on here. It's like the, the patient is on life support, you know, it's like every system, every sort of social system is really experiencing kind of a meltdown right now, which I find Chris Hedges article that sort of reviews the history of empires, 70 empires and how they fall. You know, we are clearly at the teetering stage and, you know, and it's really important for us to be, you know, to sort of think big here because this problem doesn't get solved. We are not going to solve the issue of the, you know, growing authoritarianism and the assault on human rights and civil liberties. Uh, we're not going to solve that um, outside of the bigger problem. And, you know, so I think it's really important for us to seek, um, uh, you know, alliances and, you um, you know, a broader uh, movement really for for democracy and human rights, um, you know, and, and peace because it's fundamentally, you know, I find the concept of empire very unifying right now in terms of, you know, how these struggles are, are interrelated and, um, you know, how we sort of need a bigger system change in order to fix them uh, at the same time that we continue you know, looking for pressure points within the system that we're, uh, that we're working in. And, you know, I think right now that the health aspects of this case are under review, it's a really important time for us to just keep um, hitting on this. And, you know, maybe we can strategize afterwards, uh, particularly uh, as Sue was saying on, um, you know, on social media, there may be ways that, um, you know, we can seek uh, broader coverage right now as doctors for Assange, because this is sort of our area and it would be, um, you know, I think empowering for people to hear this perspective. And I actually, I have a question for Joe. Do you have any idea what the time frame of this hearing or maybe Elizabeth, um, you know, what what's the time frame of this hearing that's opening? I think you said the 11th of August. Is this a a one day affair, is this open-ended? Is this expected to go on weeks? What's, you know, what? And I also have to say, it's just like unthinkable. Why is that being reviewed and not not the testimony of the witness who just confessed that that it was all made up? Why is that not under review? I mean, this, this whole thing is just, it makes such a mockery of our system of justice. It's it's outrageous. But yeah, how long, how long? And I think that's an important point for us to make here, you know, uh, and sort of an overarching point as we make the, you know, medical um, uh, case clearer. Uh, but how long will this go on? Joe, do you have any idea? Uh, or Elizabeth? No, I, I have no idea, Jill. I would imagine a one day hearing, but I really don't know, but it's August 11th. We'll have to keep, stay tuned. Right. We're gonna have an article from our legal expert, uh, Alexander McCurris coming in a day or two. So he may explain right. that, yeah. Uh, just finishing that, I, I think this is a really important point for us to, um, you know, put our heads together uh, as doctors for Assange. I mean, this I think this really calls for a uh, another kind of press offensive, you know, and a, and a press release. I hate to, uh, you know, load more work on people, but I think this is really kind of time critical. Yeah, and this whole situation with this hearing that you're discussing is, uh, it brings up the, 
the indefinite kind of nature of this process. And we've ta- you all have spoken about the way in which this could drag on and drag on. And so we talk about the um, torturous and inhumane conditions that he would face in the United States. But if any of you would like to just comment a little bit further, get into a little bit more depth about the inhumane conditions he's facing right now and the psychological effect of not knowing when this will actually reach a conclusion. Yes, with respect to that, uh, we heard, um, again, public facts from Stella, uh, his fiance, that he is in mental turmoil, uh, was I think an exact quote. Um, Due to COVID restrictions, he went eight months from roughly September to April or May with no visits, in-person visits from her and, and their two boys. That did finally happen, I think, in June. Um, you know, his calls are restricted. We've read about how, you know, he gets 10 minute calls and exactly 600 seconds, the call is abruptly cut off and shut down immediately. And the special rapporteur did identify the cause of his psychological torture as the legal persecution uh, combined of four supposedly Western democratic enlightened civilized nations the United States, the UK, Ecuador, and Sweden. So the whole legal process is the root cause of the torture. The torture goes on. The torture is not ending. The arbitrariness of it is a huge aspect of the torture and the key component of it. And here we go one more time. You know, we were all told and reassured that the high court denied the US appeal on the basis of Dr. Koppelman, you know, trying to exclude Dr. Koppelman's uh, testimony or derogate it or undermine it in any way. And now uh, just, I think it was yesterday or the day before this August 11th hearing comes up and the high court is gonna let the United States, Joe Biden, his government, Merrick Garland's DOJ through their UK solicitors um, make a run at Koppelman again. And it's arbitrary, it's like, what's going on? Why is that allowed? How can that possibly be? Um, and Koppelman's evidence is solid, you know, it's really unassailable and the judge was absolutely right to rely on it. No other expert who testified had anywhere near the level of interaction with Assange, his family, his acquaintances at the various critical time points along the way, Uh, you know, like any patient, uh, he fluctuates. So the prosecution psychiatrist spent four hours with Assange spread over two visits when Assange you know, was doing relatively well compared to other points where he was doing much worse. The prosecution psychiatrist, uh, Nigel Blackwood, had a really grotesquely incomplete picture of Assange's health, whereas Koppelman had the complete view. So the arbitrariness of this is frustrating to us all, but it's torturing Assange. I would add to that. Absolutely agree with all of that, Bill. Uh, And, you know, in terms of suicide risk to key risk factors for suicide are hopelessness and helplessness. And the longer this drags on and there's no sense of anything that Julian or his team does really having an effect, even when he wins his case, he's still in Belmarsh. Even when there's solid medical evidence, that can be challenged. You know, you could expect hopelessness to be uh, increasing and helplessness not you know when you, it's open-ended you don't know when it's going to end you don't know what you can do to defend yourself and that that would certainly increase suicide risk um, and not knowing how long something's going on not having something tangible to work towards you know we, you know if you think about being tormented being terrified having your life on the line being helpless being isolated you know every moment can feel like an eternity an hour can feel like a week a day can feel like a month the prospect of that going on in an unending way can become really unbearable. There's all things that we can sort of imagine and relate to when you're somewhere where you don't have stimulation, you don't have you don't have human contact, you know, in a meaningful, ongoing way. Um, I mean, it's not hard really to imagine how corrosive that can and will be um, to his mental state and his suicide risk in the UK. I don't know if you want to add anything, Derek, with your with your background. No, just endorse uh, what you say that the interminability of it, the helplessness of it, is, is uh, you know, is, is real. I mean, I do think there's a realistic possibility this guy will end up dead. Um, and I think the states that have persecuted him won't be entirely unhappy. It will be a disposal of a certain kind. We have to do everything we can. Um, 
uh, but uh, the interminability is a staggering thing, isn't it? I don't know whether the fact that the, uh, the chief witness has been shown to be a liar or has recanted, does that give the legal team any further options? Only if they do a cross appeal. In other words, to appeal the parts of Beretz's decision, which agreed with everything the U.S. said, everything they said on yeah. the First Amendment, on the computer intrusion charge, she agreed with everything that the U.S. said. She only denied the extradition based on the medical uh, condition and the condition of U.S. prisons. So sure. that all depends on whether they want to cross appeal the other parts of that. We don't know whether they will or not. Yeah, I see like to welcome you all to um, share any last thoughts before we sign off if you'd like to if there's anything you feel we haven't covered that you'd like to add yeah i have one more uh and that's the fact that in rereading um the judge's decision to deny extradition to the united states it strongly implied if not outright stated that the mere decision itself to extradite to the united states is highly likely to trigger a suicide and also, um, the U.S. prison conditions, you know, the U.S. assurances about special administrative measures, which are unconscionable, um, and not putting him in ADX Florence, uh, doesn't mean he won't be in solitary confinement. The use of solitary confinement, inappropriate and torturous use of solitary confinement is rampant throughout U.S. federal prisons and, and a lot of state prisons, too. Um, so, and then the other thing is the U.S. has given this assurance in the past and violated it. So Abu Hamza, uh, the, the, in the extradition hearing, there was testimony from his defense attorney uh, that they, the, the, the judge was assured, oh, he's so medically um, unhealthy, he couldn't, that, you know, they would never put him in special administrative measures. Well, as soon as he got to the U.S., they put him in special administration measures. And as far as I know, he's still there. So the U.S. has no reliability on keeping these kinds of promises. It's not worth the paper it's printed on or the electrons it's transmitted or photons it's admitted over. Uh, it's completely unreliable assurance and is probably irrelevant to boot because the decision itself to extradite is what is also a high risk for triggering suicide. And I just want to add briefly that, um, you know, I feel like uh, Julian Assange is a very important, you know, I say this in part for him as if we could talk to him, uh, but I'm also just saying it for myself, you know, I feel like this case is a really important rallying point. And I hope that, uh, you know, as Bob Gill was saying before, that, you know, it is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a source of, hope perhaps to Julian Assange that people are rallying around him. And I think it's really important for him to know how important he is. Uh, you know, I think this is, you know, true of um, uh, other whistleblowers as well, you know, but especially in the case of Julian Assange, because there's so much that this case is a microcosm of, and he is such a focal point for our not just resistance, but for our rallying and for our, you know, efforts to transform our internal uh, disease, you know, in the U.S. Empire, we are, our democracy is extremely sick right now, and so everything else is very sick. This case represents a confluence of so much of that, you know, that sickness in our basic, you know, our civil liberties, the fact that we're an empire at eternal war, um, uh, you know, using over 50% of our discretionary budget to destroy the world, to destroy democracies, you know, the fact that we have 68 regime change um, uh, initiatives to our credit, you know, the US empire since the second world war, you know, a hundred military bases. We have special operations troops in 149 countries. You know, if there has ever been a history, a, a, an empire in the history of the world, we are it. And we represent all the dangers of the globalization of empire. It's a very uh, disastrous thing. And, you know, not to make this so big, but there's an awful lot that's wrapped in the, up in uh, Julian Assange's case. It's not only about civil liberties, it very much is about perpetual war and empire and holding government accountable. 
you can't have a democracy and have an empire. You know, we have to choose which are we. And, you know, Julian Assange and the fight for Assange is really a fight for uh, our democracy and for our future. So if you hear us, Julian Assange, or if you if a report of this ever gets back to you, uh, we need you. You know, we really need you to hang in there. Uh, for us so that we can mobilize ourselves and rescue our future. We are all uh, imperiled by this. You're a, a symbol really of, uh, you know, of our, um, uh, our reclaiming uh, our democracy. So we all need to hang in there, especially Julian Assange. Thank you so much. I think that's a great point to leave off on. And I'd like to thank the time spent by all of our guests here, uh, including Dr. Bob Gill, Dr. Lisa Johnson, uh, Dr. Jill Stein, Dr. Derek Summerfield, Professor William Hogan, and Dr. Sue uh, Wareham, uh, and my co-host, of course, uh, Consortium News Editor, Joe Lauria, as well as our executive producer, Kathy Bogan. For CN Live, I'm Elizabeth Voss, and thank you again, everyone, for watching. <music>are consumer of independent news and the first place you should be going to is consortium news and please do try to support them when you can it doesn't have its articles behind a paywall it's free for everyone it's one of the best news sites out there and it's been in the business of independent journalism and adversarial independent journalism for over two decades i hope that with the public's continuing support of consortium news it will continue for a very long time to come thank you so much